Oh, make me rich. Kidding. All right, chemistry 3111. Last class, we said we would look at a couple of these problems that we left uh, for today. And one of them was this one here, 21.25C. And the question, just as a reminder, uh-oh, some problems here. Come on, Apple Pencil. Uh, <laughs> just as a reminder, the question is, predict the major product obtained when each of the following compounds undergoes a Claisen condensation. So remember that a Claisen condensation is you take an ester, you deprotonate using sodium methoxide or whatever alkoxide you need to to avoid transesterification. And then that's going to react with another ester. Of course, you lose the alkoxy group and you end up with a beta keto ester. Okay, so we should end up with a beta keto ester. And so if you need to draw a partial mechanism, you know, for this reaction, there's nothing wrong with that. And this is something I encourage my students to do. As you see, I did in the first example, if you treat this with ethoxide, and remember, it can't be methoxide, it can't be hydroxide, it has to be ethoxide because you have an ethyl ester. Okay, if it was methoxy, if it was a methyl ester, you'd have to use methoxide. If it was an isopropyl ester, you'd have to use isopropoxide, right? And again, that's to avoid transesterification. So what's going to happen is when you treat that with ethoxide, you're going to get, oops, let me write it here in black. You're going to get some of the enolate form. So I'll draw the enolate form like this, okay, like that. And then really what happens next is nothing more than a nucleophilic acyl substitution. I'm not going to draw the entire mechanism, but we get a nucleophilic attack here. And of course, we, of course we form our tetrahedral intermediate. Then after we form the tetrahedral intermediate, we end up losing the ethoxy group. And after a couple more steps, we end up with we end up with our final product. So to draw the final product, all you have to do is draw the starting material. Okay, so I'm going to redraw the starting material, material. Okay. Then we have our alpha carbon here. And so we have our beta carbon here. All right, and what's going to happen is we get a beta keto ester. So just ignore that beta carbon for now. And if we draw a bond out here, we're going to have a carbonyl, right? We get a beta ketone. So we have a ketone, and that ketone comes from this part of the molecule, everything except the O ethyl group. So we're just going to draw the remainder here. I'm going to have to kind of move my bonds around here like this and like this. And there you go. So this is a beta keto Beta keto ester is what you call this um, compound. So there you go. And of course, you have to do the proton transfer and everything at the end. I'm not putting in the entire um, the entire set of reactionary steps here, right? In the end, you're going to have to treat it with hydronium and everything like that. But there you go. Give me a thumbs up if you're with me on that one. The first Claisen, because we're going to look at a Diekmann in a few seconds. Okay, and we're also going to look at a directed Claisen reaction. So let's look at a directed Claisen condensation. And that's, um, how do we know that here we need to use a directed Claisen? Well, I'll show you. It says, identify the reagents that you would use to produce each of the following compounds using a Claisen condensation. And like I told you, you have to use a directed, directed Claisen reaction or condensation. Okay, and the reason why we know that is because we're not using the same ester twice. It's not the same ester reacting with itself. You can see that we're going to have one ester here, right? If we do a disconnection, and the second ester is going to come from here. So if we do a retrosynthetic analysis, we're going to need this ester. Let me, yeah, I'll draw it in red. doesn't matter. We're going to need this ester, okay? This is called ethyl propanoate. And then the other ester that we're going to need is going to have all of this. Right. And then, of course, it is also going to be an ethyl ester. So those are the two reactants that you're going to need. Now, this one, um, the ethyl benzoate has no alpha protons. And so the best strategy that we could take here would be to start with the ethyl propanoate. So we'll start with our ethyl propanoate and we're going to treat that with LDA. Right. To deprotonate everything that's going to give us complete deprotonation. Then in the second step, we're going to treat it with our ethyl benzoate. So I'm just going to replace the aromatic ring with pH, which represents the aromatic ring. Okay, so we treat it with ethyl benzoate. And then in the last step, we treat it with aqueous acid. And that is going to give us the final product like that. 
So again, a directed Claisen, right? If we have two different esters together. The last one is the same thing. We make a disconnection, and you can see we're going to need, need the same old ethyl propanoate. That's the first one. And then the other one is going to be this ester. So we're going to have, of course, O-ethyl again, right? Because we want to have the same uh, alkoxy group. And again, we're going to use a directed um, Claisen condensation. Why? Because we want to get complete deprotonation of our ethyl propanoate, and then we're going to allow it to react with the other ester. So we're going to put down ethyl propanoate. We're going to treat it with LDA. That does a complete deprotonation. And we're going to treat it with the other ester, which is going to look like this. All right, like that. And then in step three, we're going to treat it with aqueous acid. Right. That's how we have to end our Claisen condensation reaction. So that gives you the final product. So that's a directed Claisen condensation. And I think the last problems that we're going to look at before we begin some new material today are these Dieckmann cyclization. So you can see that I started the mechanism here. So why don't we do the whole mechanism together of the first one at least. So we can see that if we treat that with um, with um, it says sodium ethoxide. So if we treat this with sodium ethoxide, we end up producing the enolate here. So I've got that drawn already. Then we have the nucleophilic attack. So let's draw what the tetrahedral intermediate is going to look like. So we have our aromatic ring intact. Then if we count one, two, three, four, five, we have a five membered ring. So let's draw that five membered ring on carbon number two. Oops, that's too long. On carbon number two, we have an ethyl ester coming off of it on carbon number uh, three. So if we go one, two, three, we're going to have our alkoxide, right? And then we have our O ethyl group like this, okay? And so now we need to lose our leaving group. And again, this is our E1CB reaction here. So we're gonna regenerate the double bond, lose ethoxide. And that's going to give us something that looks like this. So we end up regenerating the carbonyl. And at this point, it looks like you're done, right? It looks like, okay, well, I've got my beta keto ester. The whole reaction is done, but it's not, okay? The reaction is not done at this point. Why? Because you have a very acidic proton here, right? And that's one of the driving forces of this reaction is that another equivalent of the ethoxide ion, okay, because you still have ethoxide in there, it's going to rip that proton off to make a doubly stabilized enolate. Now, I'm not going to draw all the resonance forms, but I will draw the enolate. So we have a lone pair here. There we go. Negative charge. Okay. And again, this is the driving force. And you should be able to draw a resonance structure that puts the negative charge on this oxygen or this oxygen. I'm not going to do that now. But... The last step is going to be to treat this with aqueous acid. So then we treat it with H3O plus, right? And then we're going to get a proton transfer in the end, and we're going to protonate here. And that gives us the final product, which is going to be something that we've drawn already, but we're going to draw it again. So we end up with our beta keto ester. All right. So it looks something like this. There you go. So in the interest of space, um, there's not enough room to do the last one here, but you can imagine that you're going to form the enolate like this, and then there's going to be some kind of nucleophilic attack, right? Like this, you're going to form a tetrahedral intermediate. So why don't we save this one for class on Monday, and I'll get everybody to try this one over the weekend and see what kind of answer you get, and we can take a look at it then. All right, so that brings us to a new section. This is section 21.5. There's two more sections in this chapter that deal with new chemistry. Section 21.7 is kind of a review of the synthesis. It kind of adds one little nuance at the very end, but there are two more major sections of new chemistry, and this is the second to last one. So this is about alkylation at the alpha position, and we know that if we have a ketone, like the one that's shown here, this is just plain old cyclohexanone, we know that this is an alpha carbon here, right? And of course, you know that that's got two hydrogens on it. I don't even have to do that for you because you've been studying organic chemistry for so long that you know that. And you know that if we treat that with LDA, what that's going to do is you're going to rip off one of those protons and you're going to form an enolate. 
And of course, it has a resonance form. And again, I don't need to tell. If I don't need to tell you, why am I telling you? Anyhow, you have a resonance form here that I know that all of you could draw in your sleep by now, okay? But what happens is once you make that enolate, if you put in that in the presence of a methyl or a primary alkyl halide, it can do an SN2 reaction like this, and then you install an R group on the alpha carbon. So this is called alkylation at the alpha position. And you probably noticed that that reaction, that mechanism that I drew at the end, which is kind of, you know, covered up with a whole bunch of stuff here, so I'll erase it. But you see the mechanism of, of the second step is an SN2, isn't it? Right? You're just doing a nucleophilic attack, right? Loss of leaving group simultaneously or concerted. And we know that that's, um, that's a, an SN2 reaction. Now, what do you know about SN2 reactions? Well, I know you all know a lot about SN2 reactions, right? You know what the limitations or the restrictions are on SN2 reactions. And when we have a tertiary or a secondary alkyl halide, you don't generally get SN2. You're going to get elimination, right? You're going to get E2. And so the aldol reaction is also going to compete, right? Think about that. If we just go back here just for a second, if instead of using LDA, if you use sodium methoxide, you'd have this um, and the starting material, right, in solution, and then you'd get an aldol reaction. Well, that's no good. That's not what you're trying to do. So you need to avoid that. And the way you avoid that is by using a really strong base like LDA. And that, so you get complete deprotonation, right? The only thing you would have in your reaction mixture is this, okay? So it's ready to do an SN2. You wouldn't have any of the uncharged ketone whatsoever. Now, what happens if you have um, a ketone that already has an R group on it, right? Let's say you had one methyl cyclohexanone. Right, let's, let's, or sorry, two methyl cyclohexanone. What if you had this compound? Well, which proton is gonna, gonna be pulled off? Would you pull off this alpha proton or this alpha proton, right? And that's an issue of regioselectivity. Um, and can we, and if you're wondering, you know, can we control whether I pull off the, the red proton or the blue proton? Well, you probably guessed by now that I wouldn't be talking about it if there wasn't a way to do it. And of course we have a way to do that. So what you do in this situation is you actually choose the appropriate base. So again, if you pull off this proton in red, that's the more hindered proton. Oh, sorry, I have the wrong one drawn on the wrong. So if you draw the pull off the red proton, that would give you this enolate, right? The more substituted enolate. So this one is the thermodynamic enolate because it's more stable. And if you pulled off the blue proton or one of the blue protons, you would end up with what we call the kinetic enolate. And why is it kinetic? Because it's less substituted, so it's not as stable, but the proton is less hindered, right? It's less sterically hindered. And so the kinetic enolate full forms faster, but it's not as stable. And the thermodynamic forms slower, but it's more stable. So it's like, well, which one am I going to pull off? And again, it's nothing more than choosing the appropriate base and the appropriate temperature. That's all we have to do. So, of course, you have to know it. But if you're the kind of person that has to look at a reaction coordinate diagram to understand things, and actually I would think that would be a good thing. If you were the kind of person who turned to these diagrams to get an understanding, that's a good thing as an organic chemist or any kind of chemist really. And so your understanding is this, well, look, if I treat it with a base and I pull off the proton that has the lowest activation energy, meaning I'm pulling off the, hmm, I'm pulling off the red proton here, well, that's less sterically hindered. So the activation energy it's going, to be, it's going to be much lower. So let me just try to draw this as neatly as I can. Right, I have a lower activation energy. But if I pull off the blue proton, well, that one is more sterically hindered. So then my activation energy is going to be much greater, right? We'll call this EA prime or something like that. But again, um, when I pull off the red proton, or sorry, the, yeah, I keep doing that. The red proton, the kinetic enolate isn't as stable, right? So it's higher in energy or potential energy than the thermodynamic enolate. Like, give me a thumbs up if you understand this. Or stop me if you have a question about this, because I think it's important that you understand the difference between thermodynamics and kinetics. If you're sitting there and you're still on the fence about thermodynamics versus kinetics, and you don't want to re, if you don't want to review all of general chemistry too, a good place to go would be chapter six in our textbook. Our textbook, chapter six, covers the whole gamut of kinetics versus thermodynamics. So you can take a look at that if you need to. Now, let's uh, kind of let the cat out of the bag. What are the conditions that we use? So, okay, okay. So if you wanna make the kinetic enolate, 
what you do is you use LDA, okay, so LDA at minus 78 degrees Celsius, all right? And if you want to form the thermodynamic enolate, you use sodium hydride, okay, and you do it at room temperature. Now, if you're wondering why would you choose minus 78, why didn't you just choose minus 80? It's a good question, but minus 78 comes from a bath of um, or a mixture of dry ice, so that's all. I don't know why I have in the gaseous phase then. So it comes from a mixture of solid carbon dioxide and isopropanol. So when you mix isopropanol with with um, dry ice, you get a bath that the temperature is minus 78. And so chemists use this all the time for a for a cold temperature bath. Okay, so that gives us the kinetic enolate. And again, you're pulling off the the less substituted proton, right? The one that's less sterically hindered. And you can also imagine that LDA is going to pull out that proton preferentially because you remember that lithium, or LDA stands for lithium diisopropyl amide. So that's this base here. So LDA is quite sterically hindered, right? So it's going to have real difficulty pulling off this blue proton, but it can pull off the red proton with relative ease. So LDA, low temperature, and then we do our SN2, right, in the second step, and we get alkylation um, at the less hindered carbon. Okay, for the thermodynamic enolate, we use sodium hydride. Now, hydride, right, the hydride ion is just this, right? That's the smallest base you could possibly have, right? So you can see how it's very small and sneaky, and it can get in here, right, and make your enolate, uh, again, with relative ease because it's so small. So uh, there you go, and you do that at room temperature and you end up forming the more stable enolate, and then you alkylate in the more substituted position once you do the SN2 reaction. All right, so kinetic versus thermodynamic enolate, and then we get the kinetic product. So again, this would be called the kinetic product, and then this one here would be the thermodynamic product. Thermodynamic. There we go. So well, let's see if we can practice this. And this is something that students usually master very quickly and they're you know better than me at probably so the first one we're taking this um cyclohexyl methyl ketone and we're treating it with lda at low temperature and then we're treating it with methyl iodide in the end so if i put in this proton in blue and if i put in this proton in red if i'm doing this reaction with lda which one of those protons would i pull off preferentially could anybody help me out would it be blue or red uh, yeah exactly thanks maria my students are great. Exactly. You're going to pull off the red proton, aren't you? Right. And again, if you draw the structure of LDA, lithium diisopropyl amide, is this big old bulky base, right? It's going to have a, it's too sterically hindered to get in there, but it can go and pull off this proton in red. You make the enolate. So I'll just draw the enolate. Okay. There we go. It looks something like this. And then in the next step, we're going to treat it with iodomethane. So there's iodomethane. We do our SN2, nucleophilic attack, loss of leaving group, and we end up with our final product. There you go. So now you have cyclohexyl ethyl ketone, all right? Um, so I was talking to a student, I can't remember if it was somebody in this class or not, yesterday uh, after class, and was, we were talking about adding a carbon if you just add one carbon to a compound like let's say and this has got nothing to do with what we're studying right now but let's say you drew you know pentane and let's say maria drew pentane and i said oh maria can you draw the homolog the word homolog in organic chemistry just means you add one carbon to it so it just means you add a carbon so what you end up with the final product is the homolog of the initial product i don't even know if the word homolog is in the textbook but it's but it is a term that we use in organic chemistry. Anyhow, I thought you might find that interesting. The next one, uh, similar vein, we have one methyl cyclohexanone. We're treating it with sodium hydride, so I'll put this proton in blue, and I'll put this proton in red. And if we're using sodium hydride, which proton are we gonna rip off? Rip it off. Yeah, thanks, Deanna, perfect. Yeah, let's pull off the blue proton. There we go, oops, something like that. Yes, sir. There we go. So we end up with this is our enolate. Yeah, not the not my best artwork, but anyhow, 
And remember, this uh, alkyl halide, it comes up a lot in organic chemistry. This is called benzyl, benzyl bromide. I've told you before that this is the worst lacrimator I can think of. It might be the worst one that I, it's the worst one that I know of. And by lacrimator, I mean, if, if you put a drop of it on the floor in a lab, everybody's going to start crying. You can't help it. Your eyes will start watering so bad. Anyhow, there we go. So there you go. So we end up with our benzyl group installed on there. And there we go. So if I call this one, if I call this product A and I call this one B, which one of these is a thermodynamic product? Would it be A or B? Just kind of working through it here a little bit. Which one's a thermodynamic product? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thanks, Diana. Yeah, perfect. So this is our thermodynamic product. Thermodynamic product. And this is our kinetic product. There you go. Hot dog, we have a wiener. Perfecto. All right. Any questions about that one before we move on? Again, it's usually something my students are, are very good at. All right, well, if there's no questions, let's move on to something else. And I got a couple of syntheses to show you here. Uh, the first one is the malonic ester synthesis. The other one is the um, acetoacetic ester synthesis. It kind of sound similar in the name and it doesn't really roll off the tongue until you practice it a, a bunch of times. But these are two syntheses that I think are ingenious, I guess. I don't know. I just think that whoever came up with these is pretty bright. Um, so check it out. The first one, the malonic ester synthesis, one of the neatest connections we do in this entire class is you take an alkyl halide and then you convert it into a carboxylic acid with two additional carbons. So I think the way the book puts it is I think you guys, I think everybody who's hearing the sound of my voice knows the structure or knows the name of this compound. This is acetic acid, right? This is the acid found in vinegar. Well, what you're doing is you're kind of making a derivative of acetic acid is the way he describes it, the malonic ester synthesis. So it's pretty neat. You're adding two carbons, right? One, two carbons, and then you have the, the carboxyl there on the second carbon. So it's kind of a neat synthesis. And the way you do this is you start with diethylmalonate. Now, earlier on in chapter 20, we did the naming of the dicarboxylic acids. Do you remember my little um, mnemonic there, oh my stars go away. So this was two carbons, this was three carbons, this is four carbons, etc. So a three carbon dicarboxylic acid that's malonic acid. So that would be this carboxylic acid is, this is malonic, malonic acid. And so if you put two ethyl groups there, you call it diethylmalonate, right? That's, so that's where the name comes from in case you're wondering. And if you go back to the beginning of this chapter, when we first started talking about making enolates, do you remember that when you have a 1,3 dicarbonyl like this, that if you use a base, even a mild base, well, kind of intermediate base, I should say, like ethoxide, that it does complete deprotonation, right? It only goes in this direction because you get a stabilized enolate. Give me a thumbs up if you remember that, that you would deprotonate everything with sodium ethoxide. Everybody good with me on that? Okay, awesome, good. So now that we've made this, I, I, can, I can tell what you're thinking just by looking at you, okay? All right, so now if you put this in the presence of some kind of primary or methyl alkyl halide, you've got, you've got mail, you've got a nucleophile, right? So now you've got a nucleophile which can do things. Maybe I'll erase this so we don't get too far ahead of ourselves, but let's take a looky. And so now you can react that enolate with an alkyl halide. So check this out, this is where it gets really cool. So this might just look like your regular old everyday SN2 reaction, and it is, but you guys know about the acid hydrolysis of an ester, right? Acid hydrolysis, hydrolysis of an ester, right? We learned saponification, and then we also learned acid hydrolysis. Well, what you're going to do is if you put this in aqueous acid, it doesn't say anything about heat, but you might need to heat this up. I don't know. Maybe not. Anyhow. What you're going to do is you're going to hydrolyze both of those esters to a carboxylic acid. So now you've got this dicarboxylic acid derivative. What's neat about this thing is if you take this and you heat it up, if you take this thing and you heat it up, it doesn't, it's not stable under intense heat. So check this out. It's one of the neatest mechanisms you'll see in this class. So it undergoes a decarboxylation. 
Decarboxylation, that's just a fancy word for losing carbon dioxide, right? Which you know is a gas. So you heat it up and you end up losing CO2. So you could circle here CO2. Those atoms come off the molecule. And of course, you need another proton to go here. So this is where this proton ends up going. So here's the mechanism. Now, I do, will not ask you this mechanism. I'll even write it here. Will not ask. But I wish I did. It's just that it's not part of the learning objectives for this class. So I don't worry about it because my students have enough to stress about already. But isn't that neat, this, uh, this, um, so this cyclic mechanism here? So you end up producing an enol. All right, because this isn't, um, you know, it's like an enol um, derivative, I guess. Anyhow, this compound here. And then it undergoes a tautomerization to form the carboxylic acid. So everything that's here, right, it just kind of goes away when you heat that up and you end up making a acetic acid derivative. So there you go. So again, we have a name for this. So let's go back here. This is called the malonic ester synthesis. Malonic ester synthesis. It's kind of hard to get them all straight uh, because we're going to look at another derivative of this in a few minutes but the malonic ester synthesis so let's go back here and so this would be an overview of the malonic ester synthesis so what you would do is you would start it with diethyl malonate so again this is diethyl malonate okay you treat that with sodium ethoxide so after the first step you're going to get complete deprotonation then in the second step it's going to do an SN2 like this okay so then you add up, end up adding the, the benzyl group, and then you hydrolyze both esters to carboxylic acids. You have the decarboxylation occurring. And then, so the only thing that changes in, it, like, let's say I ask you a question about malonic ester synthesis. Look deep into my eyes, okay? If I ask you any question about malonic ester synthesis, this, this, and this, is not going to change okay that's always going to be the same in any malonic ester synthesis the only thing that we get to choose is what's the alkyl halide that's it that's the only thing that we get to change or choose sorry and then that governs what's going to get tagged onto the end of your acetic acid molecule if you want to think about it that way now i'm sure that there's somebody who's hearing the sound of my voice that said well hold on mr dion there's there's not just one proton here there's two protons couldn't I alkylate twice? Because I could do an SN2 on there twice. And the answer is, yeah, you can totally do that. And then you end up with two alkyl groups um, on your uh, acetic acid derivative. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on, on this, on the synthesis, the overall idea. Because we're going to practice it, of course. It's, it's something I really want to do with you. But isn't that a neat synthesis or what? You know, who was the person who thought up this? I, I really don't know. Um, we could probably find out if we wanted to, but, you know, it's pretty brilliant, brilliant idea. So let's take a look here. So it says propose, ugh, propose an efficient synthesis for each of the following compounds using malonic ester synthesis. So remember that this molecule, this is acetic acid, right? So this is acetic acid. So you don't get to pick any of this part, right? That part comes from the diethyl malonate. That part comes from this molecule. Okay, that's where those carbons, that's where the oxygens, that's where everything comes from. The only part that you get to pick is this part here, right? And that's going to have to come from this alkyl halide, right? X. Now, what is X going to be? Does anybody have a, a favorite halogen they like to put there? All right, Tiana said bromine. Anybody? Maria, I'm going to assume you meant to put bromine. I know you did. I'm just giving you a hard time. Anyhow, <laughs> so look, I don't, have I ever given you a lecture about, have I ever given you my quick speech about um, X? So in any alkyl halide, like what's X going to be, right? We always say X can be chloride, bromide, or iodide. I say any of them are good. Who could tell me, and this is, you should know the answer to this. I sound like a meanie for saying that. Which one of these is the best leaving group? Would it be chloride, bromide, or iodide? Which one's the king of the castle? The best of the best of these three. They're all leaving groups. But which one's the conjugate base of the strongest acid? What's the stronger acid? HCl, HBr, or HI? So it's the iodide is the best leaving group, okay? 
So if we look at acid stability or acid strength, as you go from HCl to HBr to HI, right? Strongest. Okay, so HI is the strongest acid and HCl is the weakest acid, even though it's still a strong acid. So this would be the best, the best, eh, the best leaving group. Iodide is the best leaving group, followed by bromide, and then chloride is kind of the, the bottom of the barrel, but it's still a decent leaving group. Okay, so if you're wondering, and I've had students come to me and say, well, if that's true, then why don't we pick iodide every time? And I would, I guess I could answer if I wanted to be snarky, I could say, well, pick it. You know, you can use it anytime you want. I don't care. No, but let me explain something to you very quickly that you might be interested in. So the reason why chemists don't use iodide every time as a leaving group is because alkyl iodides like this are, out of the three of these, they're the most expensive, okay? So they cost the most money. There are some alkyl iodides that are not all that expensive, like methyl iodide is, is pretty cheap, okay? But a lot of those alkyl iodides, even though they react really well, they're expensive, okay? So then the reason why you see bromine so much is because bromine is kind of like the middle of the road. It works really well, but it's not super expensive. Exactly, exactly. So bromine is it's kind of happy, right? Somebody says the Goldilocks effect, right? It's just right. It's the right balance of reactivity and price, right, Tiana? It's not too expensive and it's pretty darn reactive. So that's why bromine wins a lot of the time. However, if you buy a drug, you know, or get prescribed a drug from your doctor or something in the synthesis involved in alkyl halide, if it's being done on a mega scale, if it's being done in a big industrial building somewhere by chemists who are shoveling reagents into a reactor, okay, in that case, they'll almost always design the synthesis so that to maximize the yield with an alkyl chloride. Why? Because it's the cheapest one. So if you can fine tune the synthesis to get a good yield with an alkyl chloride, they'll go with that. Because, yeah, it's the least expensive and, right, money talks, BS walks, right? Anyhow, all right, well, that's a little talk about, you know, leaving groups that I thought you might find interesting. But again, at this class, I don't really care which one you pick. You pick whichever one you like. So what are we going to do? We're going to take our diethylmalony, excuse me, and in the first step, we're going to deprotonate it, and we're going to use um, sodium methoxide. So let me write that down here. So sodium methoxide in the first step, and you can put ethanol as a solvent if you want, okay, it doesn't really change my life a whole lot. Then in the second step, we put in our electrophile. So we put in our electrophile. We'll choose an iodide because we're, we're high rollers. And then in the last step, we're gonna hydrolyze the whole dang thing with um, aqueous acid. We'll even cook it up a little bit to do the decarboxylation, and that's gonna give us our product like that. All right. Let's do the next one a little bit faster. So the first part, right, this part of the molecule, we don't get to choose this at all, okay? That part comes from the acetic acid. So this part is gonna come from an alkyl halide. So that's gonna come from this alkyl halide. And then this part, I'll circle it in black, is gonna come from ethyl iodide. So something like that. Now, does it matter which one you put first? No, not really but I guess you could do the, the less hindered one first maybe, so the reaction would be higher yielding the second SN2. But again, I wouldn't care which one you did first. So let's start out with our diethyl malonate. So we'll scribble that in. Then we're gonna treat that with sodium methoxide and ethanol. I, I never thought of that, Tiana, the Goldilocks effect. I'm gonna have to write that down in my notes during the break here. Number two, um, it's going to be, we're going to treat it with ethyl iodide. So at that point, you would have this compound. So you would have the ethyl group installed. So ethyl. Then you're going to treat it with sodium ethoxide again. And you're going to treat it with the second alkyl halide, which was this. This would be isobutyl iodide. And then if we, of course, I'm just going to put here, step three is aqueous acid. And cook it up, and that's going to give you the product, just like that. There you go. What do you think? Hot dog. We have a wiener. All right. Looks pretty. Everybody, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the malonic ester synthesis. All right. That's what the subject is here. Right. It's the malonic ester synthesis. 
And, you know, every organic chemistry student in second, you know, semester organic chemistry in America has to learn this reaction. It's an important reaction in organic chemistry. All right, let's see here. Did I have something else here? Yes, I had the acetoacetic ester synthesis. So before we can take a break, I want to go over this synthesis with you. And for this one, it's just a, a variation of the malonate synthesis, uh, the malonic ester synthesis. So this is called the acetoacetic ester synthesis. And I think you all know this compound. So if I write this structure here, does everybody know the name of this compound? The simplest possible ketone known to man? I'm sure a lot of people have it at home. No, this would be acetone, right? So this is acetone or propanone, propanone, son of a gun, propanone, there we go. And acetone is a paint thinner, it's used as nail polish remover. So um, what we do in the acetic, acetic ester synthesis is we make derivatives of acetone. So if we draw acetone like this, what we do is we end up putting some kind of R group or maybe two R groups, nah, it's kind of ugly, on an acetone molecule. All right, so there you go. So what it does is it converts an alkyl halide to a methyl ketone, or you could say it's an acetone derivative. Either way works, it's the same thing. So now instead of using diethyl malonate, we use this new molecule with a sassy name. This is called ethyl, ethyl aceto, aceto um, acetate. So ethyl aceto acetate. So you would not only have to have um, diethyl malonate memorized, but you've also got to have ethyl aceto acetate memorized, okay? So you have to know that. You don't have to memorize the name. I, I suppose you might maybe, but um, the main thing is know the, the structure of the reagent. So you can imagine that after the first step, if you treat that with sodium ethoxide, you end up with a doubly stabilized enolate. Then in the second step, it does an SN2, right? And then you hydrolyze that, and then you end up with um, you end up with a carboxyl group again, right, from this side, and the carboxyl isn't stable under heat, and so you do a decarboxylation, right? In the last step, you lose carbon dioxide, and so, again, it's the same thing as last time. So with the um, acetoacetic ester synthesis, this part here, the ethyl acetoacetate, the sodium ethoxide, and the water, sorry, the aqueous acid and heat, that never changes. The only thing that you get to pick is the alkyl halide, and that is going to govern what goes on your acetone molecule. Give me a thumbs up or stop me if you have any questions about that. Does that seem reasonable? This is the, the, the simplest possible way I can think of to explain it, okay? And again, it's not simple because it's organic chemistry. There's nothing simple in this class. But let's give it a shot with the first one, see if we can do that. And then we'll take a short break and then we'll come back and we'll try the second one, okay? So if we're doing the um, acetoacetic ester synthesis, right, we're gonna start with ethyl acetoacetate as our starting material. I'm gonna write it in, no, I'll write it down like this. So ethyl acetoacetate, which looks a little something like this, okay? So that's our starting material. Now remember that this part of the molecule, one, two, three carbons, right? Look, one, two, three, that comes from here. One, two, three. So this part comes from this part of our reagent, all right? So the part that we get to pick is this part right here. And that must have come from this alkyl halide. Okay, so what's our first step? Is we're gonna treat the starting material with sodium, eth nah, getting ahead of myself, sodium ethoxide and ethanol. Then in the second step, we're gonna treat that with the alkyl halide, which is zoink, like that. In the step three, if we don't get to pick, it's aqueous acid and heat, okay, we heat it up, and you end up making, can I just draw the intermediate for you just for the hell of it? Okay, so right before you heat it, what you end up with is this, after you've after you have um, done the treatment with acid, right? But this isn't stable. This is what undergoes a decarboxylation and the mechanism isn't even included in our textbook. And then you end up with the product. Okay, you end up with this product right here. All right, so what I'd like to do now is take a short break 
And I know that you can probably all solve this problem in your sleep. The students are very fast, but we know we don't get to choose this part. So you need to figure out what the electrophile is to make the, add this part and this part. And I know you all know the answer, but of course we're going to have to do two alkylations, right? Sodium methoxide, alkyl halide, sodium methoxide, alkyl halide, and then cook it up in acid. And that's going to give us our final product. So that will be the end of section 21.5. And after that, we're going to get into section 21.6, which is conjugate addition reactions. So something uh, completely different. All right. So if you remember me talking about the Michael reaction last class, so this is where the Michael reaction is going to come into play. But anyhow, we'll take a short break and then we're going to come back and we're going to try 21.33B. Um, right.